You know you're in strange and uncharted waters when it's the Liberal Democrats that are the defenders of freedom and liberty. Considering how illiberally and undemocratically they have behaved over the past five years, what with all their democracy dismissing bollocks to Brexit rhetoric. It really is quite remarkable how in such extremes they have managed to locate their principles, hiding at the back of the sock drawer where they never previously thought to look. Of course for a major political party that is nevertheless playing a distant third place, it could be, and let's face it, it probably is, just political opportunism. From the highs of being a junior partner in a coalition government, the Lib Dems are further away from actual political power than they have been since the First World War. To suggest, to suggest they are an irrelevance is an understatement, and as such they can afford to spout any number of noble positions without them being even remotely in a position to enact them. But with the majority Conservative government having turned out to be perhaps the very, very worst we've ever had, Her Majesty's loyal opposition are achieving the impossible in being a prospect that is even worse than that. So the Conservatives, instead of using their 80-seat majority to escape the clutches of the European Union, have instead used this unassailable position to destroy the economy, remove our liberties, bypass Parliament and turn my beloved country from an ever more intrusive surveillance state into a full full-on totalitarian medical tyranny in the space of 12 very short months. And the Labour Party, far from opposing the government and scrutinising its unprecedented measures, have just rolled out the red carpet for De Feffel Johnson and his pathetic head boy, Mengele Matt Hancock. But there's always a silver lining, even though it feels as if I'm scanning a mushroom cloud to find one. But one there is, and it's this. The reason, and the only reason as far as I can see it, after studying it most of my adult life, why we always have a Conservative or a Labour government is that people are only ever voting not to put their side in, but to keep the other side out. It's an established psychological principle that people are more afraid of losing X than they are of winning X. Gamblers and entrepreneurial business types don't have this attitude. Really shit gamblers ought to, but don't, and will gamble away the money, property and assets of close friends and family on the merest chance that they will win. And crap entrepreneurs just go bust. But normal people value security. It seems as if they value it over everything. Sadly, it is these normal people, normies, that are giving away our freedoms for the illusion of more security. But if this last 12 months has shown us anything, it is that even if you vote to keep the other side out, they still get in. Faced with a Conservative Party that morphed from libertarianism into fascism almost overnight, far from acting as a break on their excesses, which is what one would have expected from the opposition, all that Labour could do, or would do, was to criticise the Conservatives in not being hard enough, not locking down sooner or longer or more harshly, not destroying the economy fast enough, not eviscerating small businesses and the middle class effectively enough. I was, I have to say, somewhat disappointed that more people didn't vote for the Brexit Party in 2019, since I thought it was a rare opportunity to break or at least weaken the two-party system. Many thought that strategy was risking Jeremy Corbyn getting in by default, which was never really a likely prospect. But such was the fear of an old-fashioned Britain-hating socialist in number 10 that even swathes of the working class opted to go down the road of the lesser of two evils route and vote for an old Etonian. But surely now it must be obvious, it just must be, that by voting for the lesser of lesser of two evils, what you are guaranteed to get is one of two very definite evils that you, that you can scarcely get a cigarette paper between. There is no difference in any meaningful sense between Labour and the Conservatives. They are, to all intents and purposes, the same. 
they are all, I, was, I suppose we could say, globalists if one considers the number of global initiatives that they all signed up to. The real lesser evil, which might be so much less evil that it might actually be a good, is to vote for anyone except Labour or the Conservatives, or even the Lib Dems for that matter, although they might at least be useful in a tactical and very temporary <coughs> sense. We must, in short, stop voting for politicians. Now, that's easier said than done, and if Scotland's example of the Scottish Nazi Party is anything to go by, it shows that this approach doesn't come without risks. It's entirely possible that you may just elect the bunch of gangsters who may spend the next 14 years running the country into the ground to further their own grandiose peccadilloes. But although it has taken the SNP a mere 14 years to destroy the long-term viability of Scotland as a nation, it's only taken de Feffel 12 months to do the same to the entire United Kingdom. The choices are, if you still cling to the idea of the lesser of two evils, going to hell in a handbasket or going to hell in a nitrous oxide turbocharged handbasket. The choice we have is, in reality, no choice at all, because we're not a two-party state. We were a one-party state. Was Blair any different to the Tories? Is Starmer providing opposition to Johnson? We have to kick this habit. Voting for the Tories just so that Labour don't get in, don't get in, is a fool's errand. If you vote for the Tories, you don't get Conservatives in power. You get left-wing Tories, who are indistinguishable from right-wing Labour clones like Blair or Starmer. Same goes for voting Labour to keep the Tories out. The Labour Party under Blair sold out British manufacturing just as ruthlessly and carelessly as anything Margaret Thatcher ever did. Never kiss the Tory, so goes the popular left-wing refrain. Don't be so sure. But we're in a bind, as we're not due to have another election until perhaps 2024. That's still three years away. In one sense, that's disastrous, since in the hope of getting Brexit done, and how quaint and unimportant that now seems, we handed a weak-minded psychopath an 80-seat majority. But in another, it's just enough time to change our habits. The local elections are coming up in May, and I would suggest that you vote for anyone, anyone at all, who isn't standing for Labour or the Conservatives. Just try it. The local elections seem unimportant compared to electing members of parliament. But maybe you don't even bother, and I don't really blame you. But even if you feel this way, either that they're not exciting enough, or that they're just so ir ir irrelevant that you won't even vote, just do it as a fuck you to the establishment, or even simply just to see what happens. Put the cat amongst the pigeons, just do it to be difficult, just to be awkward. Just do it to make the time served feet under the table local councillors uncomfortable. Make them feel that they're not just a shoe in as they have been all those times before because people like us just couldn't be bothered. We need a shake up. Every institution and every level of government needs a shake up. Our institutions are corrupt because we've let them become corrupt. George Galloway is attempting to shake things up in Scotland by weaponising the electoral system there by taking aim specifically at the SNP. His strategy is to suggest that everyone votes for their preferred candidate first, but then votes for his Alliance for Unity party second to game the system there against the SNP, if I understand it correctly. His aim is to take great chunks out of the SNP's domination of Holyrood so as to head off another independence referendum. As such, he has my support, for what it's worth, since I live 400 miles away. But as laudable as this is, it's not the ballot box that's going to save our freedoms. Just as voting Labour or Conservative is a bad habit that we've acquired over the decades, we have also habituated another negative trait that appears to have become entrenched in little over one calendar year. 
in 12 months our sense of ourselves as free citizens and our belief in freedom as the fundamental virtue of a free society has been relegated to just another aspect to be considered, like accessible libraries or retrospective planning permission. But the idea of freedom is pristine. There have been times when other considerations seem to be in the ascendant, like after the Second World War when the welfare state was born, together with free health care for all. But the wartime generation was deserving of a safety net, having risked everything to defeat genuine fascism. It was understandable, not to say just, that returning servicemen, having put their lives on the line for the country, and by extension the state, should expect something other than medals in return. The difference then is that people knew what tyranny was, because they'd fought it, and at great expense and great sacrifice, they'd come out on top. They knew what freedom was, because they'd seen the opposite, and they weren't about to jeopardise it by letting the nanny state run all over them. They deserved their welfare state, but they knew where to draw the line. That wasn't communism, as some might say. It was a mild form of social solidarity, underpinned by hard-won freedom. The trouble is, that was 75 years ago. That's three generations of people that have been enjoying the freedoms extracted by the blood, sweat and gristle of that generation. In the latest generation's case, I fear that they are unaware or even unimpressed by the Herculean efforts of their predecessors. Just more dead white men, they'll probably say, ignoring the fact that men and women of all colours and shades fought side by side to prevent, at least in part, a medical tyranny. A medical tyranny made more sinister by the lights of perverted science. But as bad as getting into the habit of voting for either Labour or the barely indistinguishable Tories is, it's not nearly as damaging as having fallen out of, fallen out of the habit of believing that freedom is ours, that it belongs to us unconditionally, and that it is not within the gift of the government of the day to bequeath it to us from them. Government is merely, merely the mechanism by which we all negotiate our God-given freedoms with the God-given freedoms of others, so as not to trample on each other's. Now this is not always easy, since freedoms don't come without the attendant responsibilities, primarily our responsibilities to our fellow citizens. Freedom doesn't mean you can do anything you want, and unless you're an imbecile, it's never meant that. But the line we must draw and the one that we have repeatedly failed to draw, is to allow government to tell us what freedom we can have. When de Feffel Johnson issued his instruction to the British people to stay home just over a year ago, I felt distinctly queasy about it. Like a lot of others, I accepted it for a few weeks, since I trusted him not to lie to my face. I'm ashamed of that now, not because I now feel taken for a fool, although I do, but because I allowed something that set a precedent. By accepting lockdown, or more correctly, house arrest for the crime of doing nothing, we have unwittingly accepted the premise that we can now be put under house arrest for whatever reason the government deems it necessary, or even just desirable. The more virulent variant excuse we've already experienced but there could be others, another virus entirely, failing to meet the carbon emissions target, dampening inflationary pressures in an overheating economy, local lockdowns to ease local congestion, lockdowns as a response to pressure by Extinction Rebellion to get people off the streets, or by BLM to get white people off the streets. Couldn't happen? Just asked Brett Weinstein. If somebody had said in January last year, that the entire British population would have been under house arrest for more than a year by now. Nobody, and I mean nobody, except of course the architects of it, would have believed you. You'd have been called an unhinged paranoid conspiracy theorist. Funny how that has eclipsed racist 
as the insult du jour, isn't it? Almost as if it's designed to, oh, I don't know, shut you up. But by agreeing to the lockdown, even for only three weeks, to flatten the curve, remember, we have ceded some pretty important ground. Maybe it's even ground that is unrecoverable. I don't believe that, because it's never too late to stand up for your freedoms. But we have abandoned the high ground, and we have to reclaim it. We have to. We have to ensure that this never happens again. Not ever. We have failed to defend our values. We have failed to defend that which was utterly, not to mention easily, defendable. Defendable with only a minimal amount of effort. We failed to defend our anonymity. And then we failed to do that. They came for our privacy, since those two things are inextricably linked. And, when we failed to and then we failed to defend our privacy. And having failed to do that, they took the next logical step and are now, without any subterfuge, since they feel it is unnecessary, they are going for our freedom in issuing vaccine passports. So assuming it's not already too late, we have to get back into the habit of acting like free men, citizens rather than slaves. We have to get back into the habit of defending our culture, and by extension ourselves, when we are attacked. We have to get back into the habit of believing that we can change things, rather than thinking that time-served, self-interested, power-hungry politicians can do it for us. We have to get back into the habit of making sacrifices and taking risks, like our forefathers did, for the things we believe in. We have to get back into the habit of believing that freedom is ours by right, not by permission. We have to get back into the habit of believing that freedom is our natural state and not just an expression of selfishness. And we have to get back into the habit of believing no, knowing that courage and not cowardice will deliver us our freedom. We have to get back into the habit of being free men. Nothing less will do.